Um, so today we're going to talk about accessing self-hosted services remotely. Who agrees with this statement? Good. Nobody. Awesome. Who agrees with this statement? When I was 17 at an institution similar to this, to be honest, high school, technical college in England, the internet was in its, infant, MSN Messenger was still a thing, right? And I thought to myself, how can I get round my IT admin's censorship of the internet? Like, I, I want to go and look at flash video games back then. That was what censorship meant to me at 17. A bit different now, but... Um, I decided it would be a good idea back then to open a port in my firewall back home, port 3389. What does that do? RDP for Windows. I had a password on my Windows desktop of 22. <laughs> Open to the public internet. You can imagine how that ended up, right? <laughs> now, who understands what a port is? I think the easiest way I could think to explain it was an apartment block and an apartment, like the physical flat inside the building. You need an address to, to find where I live, ostensibly, right? So you go to 32 West Wallaby Street, whatever it is. And then the, the apartment number is the port number of the service that's running. So you've got your computer on 1.10, and then the port is, in this case, HTTP, an HT web, web server listening on port 80. There are a few other ports you're probably familiar with. Port 22 does SSH. DNS, port 53. HTTP, as we said, is port 80. There's a body that governs these port um, mappings, and they're called the IANA, the, uh, what is it? the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. How much do you want to go to dinner with the guy that thought of that name? Um, and you know, there, there are a bunch of other ports that are reserved below 1024. These are what's called special reserved ports, and you need to have their permission to basically publish your service on these ports officially. So SSH, like I say, is a big one that we all use. Um, 23 for Telnet, there's a, there's a bunch of others, right? Who agrees with this statement? Yeah. If you forward a port in your firewall, you're essentially putting that service out on the internet for every single person in this room to directly connect to. And if that doesn't scare the shit out of you, I'm sorry, I can't help you because <laughs> that is, that is just, it's just such like, 17 year old Alex had no idea what he was doing putting RDP on the internet. By the way, that box got owned in about a week. So, you know. So what do we do? We decide we're going to close all the ports in our firewall. We, we say to ourselves, right, no traffic, Gandalf, right? You shall not pass. That's what happens. The trouble is that means nobody else can connect, but neither can you. I can't SSH into my servers at home. And we need to find a way around this. So 17-year-old Alex goes, cool, let's open the port. And now I can connect, but as we've discussed, so can everybody else. And this is a huge security risk, which is just, it, it, it's avoidable these days. Um, and I, I always look for an excuse to trot this picture out in a talk, and this is port forwarding for me. So we think to ourselves, great, we need firewall rules. We're going to restrict traffic in and out of our network based on firewall rules. They've got to be restrictive. So we've got to say that a certain source IP address can connect to a certain destination IP address on a specific port, on a specific protocol. And we need to be very specific about what we're doing. That doesn't actually solve the port forwarding problem, though, for the most part. I mean, to some degree, if you're limiting the source IPs, you can say, like, no IP addresses from people in England can connect to my server in America, for example, or whatever, you, you know, whatever your threat model looks like. But they don't scale particularly well. Who here has worked in an organization where whenever you want to make what seems like the most simple change to your firewall, you need to open a ticket, wait for the guy to come back from lunch, then go on vacation, then come back again, <laughs> finally sort your ticket out and do it wrong. <laughs> Happens all the time. And it's only gotten worse with the cloud. VPCs, configuring security groups, all this kind of crap, right? And it's, it's just... It doesn't scale very well. There are tools. I mean, I was about to mention Terraform, but I'm not sure they're terribly in vogue this week. Um, there are tools that automate a lot of this stuff, like you know, allowing things in and out and automating firewall rules. And you could just submit PRs to your network team instead of having them do the work. You do the work, and all they do is click the box. I can still add a bit of latency, but it's better than where we used to be. 
but remote access is easy. We've, we've all agreed this, right? Oh yeah, what about my IP address? So think about what happens when you want to access, you're all here, right? And presumably some of you have a Raspberry Pi or something like that at home that you're running a few services on. How do you connect to that? There's like a whole chain of things that have to happen. You have to know what the IP address, your public WAN IP address is from your ISP. So you run a service like Dynamic DNS to, to put that in Cloudflare against an A record. Uh, and then there's that, there's that annoying bit of time in between when your IP changes at home and the DNS record script runs to update it, which can be an hour, it can be three days, or it can be the next time you leave the house and go, oh crap, this doesn't work, which is what actually happens. So th these are all the problems. What about VMs and containers though? Aren't they our salvation? To a point. I mean, when we think about how virtual machines in particular operate, their entire purpose is to encapsulate their, their being to a specific point. Now remember, they're still on a network, they're still connected to other computers, and the same is true of containers. With containers in particular, you've got often something like a load balancer running traffic in this case, where the traffic comes through your firewall, hits that hardened container, and when I say hardened, I mean this is something that's had everything removed from it except the absolute bare minimum it needs to function. In this case, traffic is a reverse proxy, and it does the thing of fetching all of your remote content. So it's it. So that becomes the, the target that the hackers want to hit, the, pe the people trying to infiltrate your network want to hit. The trouble is containers, theoretically at least, have what's called root privilege escape. I've never seen it executed in the wild. There are lots of lab kind of perfect world scenario things where people can escape the container uh, isolation and sort of jump between other containers in memory and stuff like that. Real world exploitations of that kind of thing, less common, but it can happen. So we can use VMs and containers to limit the blast radius, but as I was saying, island hopping is still a thing. It's still on the TCP IP network within that particular location. And if there's a vulnerability in some of the stack somewhere, like XZ, for example, we saw fairly recently with SSH, or Heartbleed, or goodness knows what else there is that we don't know about yet, People can get from that traffic instance to anywhere else on your subnet, even whether you want them to or not. So it's still an imperfect solution, even if we are following best practices with secure models and DMZs and all the rest of it. Right? There's still, there's still a lot of way to go. I do think that containers, for the most part, for most people at home, are good enough uh, in terms of this isolation. I realize I already said half of this, but such is life. Um, I do think that containers are pretty good for most people, but I think there is a, a better way. And what if we could just mostly ignore the firewall altogether? That would be pretty nice, wouldn't it? So today's agenda, um, we've already done the first bit, so that's good. Check that one off. Uh, we're going to look a little bit at mesh VPNs, so Tailscale, full disclaimer time. I am a Tailscale employee. I used Tailscale before I worked there, and I will be mentioning it in today's talk. Um, but just so you know, like disclosure, like I work there, I'm a corporate shill. Okay, cool. <laughs> uh, we'll do some DNS trickery with Cloudflare and C names and all the rest of it, as well as uh, some reverse proxy tips and Docker Compose stuff too. So I already did the disclaimer. Moving beyond the firewall. Okay, so this is where Tailscale comes in. So we were talking before about basically point-to-point um, -point connections through a firewall, your laptop to a specific service. Well, it would be kind of nice if every single device on your personal network, your phone, your tablet, your laptop, your server, your cloud server, everything, if, if all of those things could talk directly to each other, you don't need a firewall in the way anymore, particularly if they're making direct connections. And that's where Tailscale comes in. So a traditional VPN does this. It goes out to some kind of third-party hosted provider. I mean, it, it could technically be running inside your firewall, but let's not complicate things. It's like a hub and spokes. So you connect to a hosted VPN server somewhere that you trust or you have to trust, like a NordVPN or a Surfshark or one of these guys, and they give you an anonymous IP. In this picture, it's probably an open VPN server that you're hosting on some kind of a VPS somewhere, which then has permission to tunnel back into your personal network. Again, using port forwarding. Again, we've discussed the risks of that. With Tailscale, though, we don't do that. We establish direct point-to-point -point connections with tunnels between each device. Now, there is a coordination server using the STUN protocol that lives in the cloud. All of the data 
between these two devices is fully encrypted end-to-end. -end. So the stun server has no idea what you're saying between the two clients. The private key never leaves your device. And that's really important. In cryptography terms, that means that I, I just don't have the computational ability to unlock what you're sending or receiving. I, I say I, I mean tail scale at this point. The stun server's job, and we'll, we'll come on to this in, in just a second, is to do what's called NAT traversal. Because those of you that are sort of thinking about, well, if, if I don't need to know what my IP address is and I don't need to open a port, how on earth are these things making a direct connection? Well, using something called NAT traversal, these guys are able to abuse the way in which stateful firewalls work a little bit. So when I send out a request, I send it out to, in this case, outbound on 2222 with a specific port attached on UDP. My outbound firewall goes, oh, I've sent a packet out on that IP address to that port. If I hear something back from that place in the next 30 seconds, I'm going to allow it back in. That's how all stateful firewalls work, by the way. Mildly terrifying, isn't it? Now, if we can abuse that and say, right, server 777, they're both running tail scale. So tail scale has to find a way for those two devices to introduce themselves to each other. That's all the stun server is doing. It's recording and mapping that NAT, that NAT mapping between those two devices so that the firewalls, the stateful firewalls on each end can be like, cool, you're who I was expecting. I'm going to allow that traffic back in again. It gets a bit more complicated with things like IP masquerading and like carrier grade NAT and all the rest of it. But that is a simplified version of how tail scale works with NAT traversal. So we can see that both devices are happy and um, there, is a, there, is, there is a bit more to it, but I've only got so much time. And there is an absolutely fantastic post over on the Tailscale blog written by the guy that actually figured this stuff out in the first place. He's a bit more clever than I am. Uh, if you're interested in this, in this stuff, go take a look. Because when I was preparing this talk for Texas Linux Fest two weeks ago, and I've worked for Tailscale now for like nine months, and I hadn't read the blog post, I read the blog post and I was like, this is magic. <laughs> So I think, I think you'll all like it. All right, so that's the kind of tail scale pitchy bit over with. Um, the rest, we're going to talk about self-hosting. Hooray. Uh, how do we run services locally? This, by the way, is my data center in my basement. Cool, huh? This, uh, this, this picture is about five years old, actually. It's, it's grown a bit since then. But this is a dual Xeon box with like 10 hard drives in it and 128 gigs of RAM. Ran some OpenShift stuff for me when I was at Red Hat and a bunch of other stuff. Now I've got uh, an Epic box, which I built fairly recently, an AMD Epic box, which has got 48 threads and 256 gigs of RAM, and it's, it's complete overkill, but I love it. <laughs> and then alongside that, I have the media server, which has an i5-8500 in it, which does things like Intel QuickSync for transcoding with Jellyfin and all the rest of it. Um, so if you like the sound of any of that stuff, I have a podcast. I, th I said the shilling was over, but not quite. I have a podcast, selfhosted.show, with Chris Fisher. We're going to do a little bit of stuff with Jupiter Broadcasting in the main hall over the weekend. In fact, in here tomorrow, we're doing a live Linux Unplugged, I think, at 1 o'clock or something like that. So come join us tomorrow for that. Now, when it comes to self-hosting, you own your data. So think about this. When you send a, a photo up to Google Photos, what happens to it? They... <laughs> Well, they don't charge you. Well, I suppose they do with storage these days. Yes, a little bit. They, they scan it, and they do machine learning, and they train their models, and you feed data into the machine. Right? We've, we've seen this, in, particularly in the last year or so, as AI and ChatGPT and all these models of, of LLMs and stuff have come along to just steal your stuff. Because there's always been this argument of, well, I've got nothing to hide. I've got nothing to fear. Where's, what are they actually going to do with all this data? Well, we're seeing it now. They're finally beginning to monetize it, and it, it scares the pants off me, honestly, and I hope it does you too. So if you own your own data, that means you are in control of not only keeping it, but also losing it, which does happen from time to time. The best part is it's your fault. <laughs> Who can I blame for this one? Oh, shit, it's me. Uh, the other thing is, uh, those of you who are parents in the room will appreciate the Plex down detector or the Jellyfin down detector of children. You'll, you'll be watching some show or you'll wake up and they'll want to watch Peppa Pig and it's not working and they will tell you instantly, where's Peppa Pig? <laughs> so you own the outages too. And I, I tell you, waking up at 7am and going, 
Oh yes, my DNS server's buffer has overflowed this morning. Is is my favorite. It's my absolute favorite. But it means uh, because I built this solution piece by piece, it means that I sort of understand it anyway. And it so all the problems are learning opportunities for me. So the reason I'm sat in this chair today is because I installed Plex a decade ago. I installed Plex and then it meant, right, well, I need to run a Linux box, which was Unraid back then. And then I need to figure out how to merge hard drives together of different sizes without using ZFS because I'm a poor student that can't afford to buy Alan Jude sized disk arrays of 10 ZFS drives all at once. Um, and that kind of snowballed into learning about Docker, which led into a career in DevOps, which led into a bunch of other stuff. It's a gateway drug. And if, if you can take these skills and learn some of this stuff at home on your free time, and you go to an interview and say, hey, I know about Docker. Hey, I know about the, the benefits of containers versus VMs. You're already in the top few percent of candidates, of people that have just watched the Udemy course and think they're experts. No, you've actually done it. You've actually broken stuff and fixed it in pseudo prod in your basement. You're already in the top few percent. I, I strongly believe that. And I think self-hosting is a hugely, em, em, it empowers people to do things and operate at Docker in particular operate at skill sets above, uh, levels above where their skill set is. Because you're, you're taking, when you run a container, you're taking all of the knowledge that that person who packaged up that container had and, and trading off it. Like you don't need to know how to install Python and all this other stuff alongside each other anymore. Do you remember that in the old days? Right, I want to run Python 2 against Python 3 at the same time. And yeah, it was Java actually was the worst one. But. And by building that solution piece by piece, I'm able to carefully craft a solution that over the years is going to really last with me. And the last bullet for me is the unbeatable reason why self-hosting is with me for the rest of my life. The business model that I'm serving doesn't exist. It's, it's just me and, well, presumably some of you if you're open source developers, you know. And from my perspective, the, the social contract of that is that I help spread the word and pay it forward and you know, through the podcast and all the rest of it. And we have people on the podcast like the image developer, which I'll talk about shortly, a self-hosted Google Photos alternative, come on and you know, further the movement. So these are some of my favorite self-hosted app picks. Jellyfin, I'm sure most of you know what Jellyfin is. It's a self-hosted version of Netflix, whatever. You know, it's a video streaming kind of situation, mostly streaming Linux ISOs. But I do, you know, I have a few things in there which I miss my British TV. I mean, I live in Raleigh these days and getting iPlayer can be a bit tricky. So, you know, it is what it is. Jellyfin's awesome though because it transcodes to the specific client that you want on the fly. So I talked about having uh, the i5-8500 for quick sync uh, video transcoding. So if, if I'm, for example, on my iPhone and I want to watch a video that the iPhone doesn't natively support, Jellyfin will use FFmpeg under the hood and actually use the, the hardware GPU in my system for about four or five watts and transcode that on the fly in real time to the correct codec for my phone to play back. Plex has been doing this for a while. Jellyfin is just a free and open source alternative because Plex have a business model to serve, as I talked about. And they've kind of gone down the entitification route fairly, fairly recently. So Jellyfin for life, I hope. Next one is LibreSpeed. This is a self-hosted speed test alternative. I actually run this in a container on my server in the basement. And I did a 10 gig upgrade fairly recently. And I wanted to check that the, the link between the servers was actually 10 gig. Sure, I could use iPerf, but I could also just open a browser and press start. That's also pretty nice. And check the speed that way. You can do this um, across tail scale. So if I'm sat in this room and I wanted to check the speed from this room to my basement, I can also do that as well. Uh, with a direct connection. Git-T is pretty cool. You all know GitHub, I assume. Git-T is a, effectively a self-hosted version of GitHub. They've added some really cool stuff lately, like self-hosted runners, which let you do a lot of the CI actions and things like that locally. So if you want to build your own containers locally, automatically on a push, if you want to mirror container repositories from GitHub itself locally as well. So you think, right, I'm not sure that code base is going to stick around. You can actually mirror that locally into Git-T and it will automatically refresh that local version from the thing that's been committed to in GitHub and keep the two in sync. Nextcloud, I think Brent is not here. He was here. Anyway, Nextcloud is it's like Dropbox mixed with OpenOffice mixed with, it's a bunch of stuff, right? Nextcloud is awesome and if you haven't tried it, I highly recommend it. But my absolute favorite project at the moment is Image. This thing is 
Photos has been one of the most difficult problems to solve in self-hosting for a long time. I actually wrote about this for Ars Technica in 2020. And I compared, this, this didn't exist in 2020, by the way, so it's still fairly new, but I wrote about um, Photo Prism and a, a bunch of others. They all fell short in a number of ways, but the biggest way they all fell short was the image search, because when I've got 100,000 photos, I can't be remembering what day I took them or what location. Like, I just know I want pictures of a red truck right now. Give me pictures of a red truck. And Image, uh, a few months ago, added some of the OpenAI models that were released into their catalog, and you can now run local AI models against your own image sets, fully locally, fully offline. You're not feeding anybody else's business model, except your power companies. Um, and image is the way to do that. It's not even difficult to run this stuff locally. So this is a Docker Compose snippet for how I share audiobooks with my family. Now we buy books off of Audible, but as you probably know, those books come with DRM. And that means that you can't play them back on any device without the Audible God saying, yes, it's okay, Alex, you can pay the thing you've played, f you can play the thing you've paid for. That, by the way, really grinds my gears. I paid the money for it. It's fine, isn't it? At least that's what I think. There's an app called Libation, which lets you strip that DRM away. And then Audio Bookshelf lets you play those audio books to any device. There's the clients for Android, for iOS, even works in a browser. So literally any device. And you can see it's really complicated to deploy this. It's just a, what's that, 10 lines, 12 lines of YAML? I expose a specific port because containers, remember, are all about isolation. So you've got to be explicit of what you allow into and out of a specific container. So this is running on port 80 inside this container. It publishes it to port 2284 on the host. So if I want to get to this specific service, I do 192.168.whatever port 2284. And that's how that works. So here is a little bit of the anatomy of the request that's actually going on. I apologize, there's lots of arrows. I'll do my best to make it simple. But essentially, when you type something into a web browser, you're making a web request. So the first step is the browser needs to translate the text you've typed into an IP address. I assume we're all familiar with DNS in this room, but that's what happens. That's the first step. The next thing it does is it gets a re uh, that IP address gets returned as an IP That text gets returned as an IP address in step three and the browser creates the outbound connection. As we discussed earlier in step four, the firewall makes an outbound NAT mapping in the firewall to say, right, I want to connect to this server on this port. We talked about the stateful firewalls doing that. The uh, destination firewall receives that traffic and matches it to a specific rule set. So it either allows it or denies it. I'm going to assume in this case it allows it. Step six, we talked about the reverse proxy earlier. So step six, this is where the traffic mm -hmm. hits the traffic. I know there's two traffics there, but it is what it is. The, the web traffic from step one has finally made it to step six. And that reverse proxy has permission to connect to the underlying audiobook server in step seven and return that content. And then in step eight, that finally makes it all the way back mm -hmm. to your web browser. All this happens in a fraction of a second. Right, millions of times throughout an audiobook's playback cycle because it's, ca it's streaming tons of small fragments. But that's essentially the, the anatomy of a web request that happens here. Now, one of the things I've shown you here is in step two, we've got a DNS server. Um, I am quite a stickler for saying, I want my DNS server, I want each of my sites to be standalone. Like, if Tailscale goes down, if I disappear, you know, if I put this in at my mum's house, for example, which I have, I don't, I don't want her having to call me at 2 a.m. when the internet's not working. Like, I just want each site to be standalone. So I have a, a pie hole running in each location, which is an ad blocking service. Right? Just, I mean, it says pie hole in the name, but I run it as an LXC container on top of Proxmox. It doesn't have to run on a pie, a Raspberry Pi. Cool thing about pie hole is it's just what's called DNS mask underneath. This is a very old internet DNS project. It probably predates me having a full head of hair, honestly. It's very old, very stable, and very quick at what it does. You can see, like most things in Linux, it's just configured through files. So you've got address equals IP address, and the delimiter is a slash in this case. So it's very human readable. And so I've actually written an Ansible role, which when I want to add a new host to my network or something like that, or a new DNS record, I put that in the Ansible YAML file, run the Ansible playbook, and it deploys DNS mask to PyHole, where it deploys, well, technically it deploys the files, which then restarts PyHole, which picks it up. And it, it just works, honestly. I've been running this thing for about a year, and it's, it's great. 
People talk a lot about AdGuard Home, which is another great project in this space, but the reason I go with PyHole these days is because it's just DNS mask underneath. Okay. Now, the fun part for me the other day, like I said, I was preparing this talk for Texas Linux Fest a couple of weeks ago, and I thought to myself, right, I've got, my mum has a Synology running in England. My reverse proxy is running in my basement in Raleigh. Should I could connect those two together? And it's one of those things where you think, this won't work. This is absolutely not going to work. So I decided, why don't I, in step six, why don't I put the, re the, the resource fetching part as the tail scale IP address for a box that's in another continent? And it just worked. It, because each device is on direct connections or connected directly to each other, I put the 100.ip address in, which is the tail scale subnet that we use. And my reverse proxy in Raleigh was able to reverse proxy a Synology front end from England remotely. Now, if anybody has a Synology, you'll appreciate what a pain in the ass that thing is because their web UI reserves port 80 and port 443. So you then need to do a bunch of shenanigans with scripts at boot to turn that off and then bind those ports to your reverse proxy running on that. Don't, don't bother with that. Just do this. <laughs> now, Caddy, which is not something we've mentioned in the talk, in the talk thus far, Caddy is another reverse proxy that I am slowly falling in love with uh, compared to traffic. So they both have their pros and cons. Traffic is great because you define all of the configuration for the reverse proxy inside your Docker Compose YAML file alongside the application deployments. But sometimes, like a Synology, there are times where the application isn't a container or is some kind of external service running somewhere else. <coughs> Compare that to an Nginx configuration. Who here has done an Nginx configuration, by the way? Yeah. Surprising amount if you don't have gray hair. That's amazing. <laughs> I hate Nginx configurations with a passion. This is all that's required to get abs.wd.ktz.me a fully TLS-backed, fully qualified domain name. So I will get a Let's Encrypt certificate from Let's Encrypt because the plugin that Caddy has looks at this and goes, oh, you're a Cloudflare um, uh, registrar based thing. Right, I've got a Cloudflare plugin. I'm going to go and verify your ownership with a text record, TXT record, in Cloudflare and say, right, Alex actually owns that domain. I'm going to give you a certificate. So that's important because TLS, that's how we verify we are actually speaking to who says, <coughs> actually verify that I'm speaking to you across the internet. So if you've not come across Caddy, it's legitimately pretty cool. Now, this is the tail scale interface on the left. You can see I've got my Synology box at the bottom. Caddy is a shared node. Now, what's interesting about this is that Caddy is a, is a dedicated node on my tailnet. I've made that Caddy LXC container a node on my tailnet. You get 100 devices for free, so there's, you know, I, I can kind of go a bit crazy with what I'm doing. Some people even put each individual container on the tailnet one by one. That's a bit crazy to me, but you know, some people do it. And you can see that we've got the DSM, the, the Synology Disk Station Manager, DSM, is actually in there. And what's interesting is if ever you've tried to connect a reverse proxy to a service that only speaks HTTPS through a self-signed certificate, and you have to click that scary, let me pass the world's about to catch on fire button, uh, that's how the reverse proxies deal with it. Those three lines there, transport, TLS, insecure, skip, verify. So it just means I never have to worry about this stuff. I've always got real DNS names. I've always got real certificates for every service I touch. And it just makes things uh, it just makes things a lot easier. So, uh, what have we got left? Oh yes, a little bit of uh, C name trickery in Cloudflare. Now this is kind of fun because when my mum wants to access those audiobooks from England, she's obviously not on my tailnet because t my tailnet is mine. So I share out that caddy node with her and she can access it over the fully qualified domain name that Tailscale gives each node. In this case, it is, is it on here? No. Might be on the next one though. It is uh, caddy.velociraptor-noodlefish.ts.net. Rolls right off the tongue. Now I don't want her to have to remember that, so I want to use my real domain, which is in this case dotsandstuff.dev. So I have a wildcard put into Cloudflare as a DNS record, star.rdu, Raleigh Durham, um, and that resolves across the internet to the 100 IP address underneath of the tailscale node. The cool part is it only resolves if I share the caddy node with her tailnet and she's on tail scale, it will then resolve. If she's not on tail scale or she doesn't have the node shared in, or if, I sh if any of you tried to hit that, you can't because it's just a 100 carrier grade 
NAT reserved IP address. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't root anywhere on the internet. And so we can test this a little bit. If we use DIG, which is a, a DNS query tool, you can see at the top here we've got test.rdu.dots and stuff. And you can see it resolves on this next line down here to caddy.velociraptor. Yeah. Um, and then once we're there, we are able to connect to the audiobook server running underneath. And so my mum's happy because she can stream Lord of the Rings every single night or Harry Potter and Stephen Fry. If you want to know more about that, I made a video for Tailscale fairly recently, which goes into a lot more detail. Again, I didn't want to bore everybody with the minutiae of the solution, but it's all in there, along with a bunch of Git files and all the rest of it on the Tailscale YouTube channel. Now, I'm a little bit out of time for this one, but it's a very quick hack. If you are using Tailscale and you want to use it as a pseudo DNS server, you can do, you can, you can literally just put sp specific domains into your magic DNS and it will treat it like split DNS and it's a bit of a hack, but it works really well. Now, big reveal time. This entire presentation, nope. This entire presentation has been running from my basement in Raleigh over tail scale. <laughs> so that's it, really. Um, you, know, you can see that the presentation has got a real domain name with a C name in Cloudflare. It goes to Caddy, it does the proxying, all the rest of it. And this presentation is running over tail scale from my basement. So uh, if you're more interested in finding more about me, there's a bunch of stuff there, a bunch of links and things. Um, I'm not hard to find on the internet, I don't think. But uh, yeah, I think we've got like 10 or 15 minutes for questions. So please, fire away. Are these slides available? Yeah, I can make them available. If I share my node in my town, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I'll make them available. Can you talk a little bit more about like node sharing and tail scaling? I didn't know that was a thing. Yeah. What, what, what is that doing? Well, so note, the question was, can you talk more about node sharing and tail scale? Um, if you have a, a tail net, that entity is defined by the four walls of your tail net. Let's say I had a resource I wanted to share with you, or, or a more common situation might be uh, your wife or something, like a spouse or a partner or something. You can share a specific node with them to their tail net so they can access that resource remotely as if they're mm -hmm. on your tail net. OK, and that's just the, the coordination servers are allowing that connection? It's yeah. The TS -10 Correct. Yeah. Now you can restrict things. We have um, a bunch of stuff called ACLs, access control lists, that are basically like, and I know I said how much I hate firewall rules, but they're basically like firewall rules for your tail net. So you can say this node can talk to that node. This node can only talk to that node on this port or specific protocol or whatever you want. So yeah, it, it's pretty flexible. OK. And that node sharing is only, sorry, I can stop asking all the questions too. But, um, uh, I'm assuming only works with like tail scale to tail scale, not like with if you have a head scale instance, you can't somehow. You win the prize for being the first person to mention head scale this weekend. Okay. So those that aren't familiar, um, I know I talked a lot about data sovereignty and you know owning your own data. You might think I'm a little bit of a hypocrite sat here talking about a commercial solution, a tail scale. So there is an alternative to hosting that stun server yourself called head scale, like the gentleman mentioned. Um, that essentially replaces the tail scale proprietary control server with an open source self-hosted version. Now remember what we said about self-hosting? You're in control of your data, but also the outages. Now for me, Tailscale is so integral to my network that I don't really want that control server to have the option of going down. The other thing is that um, Tailscale employs the developers of Headscale, or at least one of them, I think. Um, so it's not like the Headscale project is gonna go away, but we're all familiar with the Fedora Red Hat model, right? Where New features get put in Fedora first, and they trickle down to Red Hat. RIP CentOS. Um, with Tailscale and Headscale, it's the other way around. So Tailscale being the proprietary one, the Red Hat, effectively, gets all the cool stuff first because it's the commercial company with 50 developers and you know salaries, and, and people are actually paid to work on that stuff. Whereas Headscale is one or two dudes that implement the best they can the features that Tailscale upstream has implemented. So it just, it flips the model on its head. The upshot of that is that sometimes Headscale just doesn't do stuff that Tailscale does, and in some cases never will. Um, it's just the reality of it. 
but we do we do embrace it we do support it it's a fully you know legitimate way to operate if you want to go down that route okay so the mechanism behind note sharing theoretically could work if it was built into head scales just correct not in the support of the project correct oh that's cool okay. yeah did I see a hand over here yes um, is there a like, latency problem with all these hops and jumps you might think so, but because the nodes are corrected, connected directly to each other, it actually removes a lot of latency from the equation. Um, the I don't know how it does it sometimes, but you can literally have two containers on a completely separate VLAN inside your house, and it finds a way to NAT traverse between those two without doing a hairpin. Wow. So it can actually reduce latency in some cases. And it, this is mostly for, I would say, private sharing that you can get to, your, only you can get to that stuff. There's Anybody can get to that stuff? Yeah, it's called Tailscale Funnel. Um, that, though, routes the traffic through one of our um, proxy servers, and you're limited to something like 20K uh, throughput. So it's really not designed for anything other than you're a developer on your laptop. Hey, I want to share this quick prototype with someone, or I want to share a, d a dev database or something. That's really what we designed it for. So you can't do a Tor server or anything like I mean, it would work. It would, I mean, Tor's slow enough already, though. Yeah. yeah. Well, the private keys never leave your device. So even if they gain control of your tailnet, which I don't think is possible, um, they could never actually access the encrypted data that you're transmitting. How do you go about backing up your tailnet configuration? I don't. <laughs> Shit, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, th there is a there is a policy file um, which is just text, huge JSON. Um, I guess I could back that up, but good point. Yeah, we'll think of, we'll think of that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Uh, you could actually put your uh, ACLs in GitHub, or excuse me, yeah, yeah, GitHub. Oh yeah, so there is like a GitOps mode for the the access control list. So if you if you have the file in um, got five minutes still. Uh, if you put the file in GitHub, you can actually have a GitHub action deploy those rules. Um, I'm, uh, thing, things like the magic DNS configuration, though, I don't think would be included in that. There might be some other things that are missing. So yeah, maybe we just need a backup button. I like that. I'll put that in the feature bucket. <laughs> there was a hand over here, I'm sure of it. No? Well, okay. I think we are good. There are some stickers at the front over here if you want to grab some self-hosted or tail scale stickers and I'll be in the main hall most of the weekend, so thank you for coming.